Hello and welcome to Game Sack, and this time we're talking about games where you get to play as the bad guy. It's not very often you actually get to play as a bad guy, so this is kind of a fun little twist on the whole thing. So you get sick and tired of being the good guy all the time, but I don't know, you'll see. Some of the games that we've covered today are pretty, pretty fun for being a bad guy game. And I like being evil, so let's go be evil. This is What Did I Do to Deserve This, My Lord 2 on the Sony PSP. This is the sequel to Holy Invasion of Privacy Batman, which was digital only, but the sequel here actually exists in real life, at least here in North America. This is almost like a tower defense game, but not really. The overall plot is that you are the Dark Lord of Destruction, assisting the evil bad man as he continues to conquer the world. But stupid heroes who are all looking for XP and maybe even to level up are trying to stop you and save the world. The game takes place in an underground dungeon built with tiles. Since you're an evil Dark Lord of Destruction, of course your main tool is a pickaxe which you use to dig up tiles of dirt. I mean, that goes without saying, right? When certain tiles are destroyed, they may spawn a monster. These monsters can be self-sustaining if they rub up against the right blocks and other things containing nutrients. If they rub over certain blocks enough, you can even spawn stronger enemies like lizard men. You need to create as many monsters as possible in a very short amount of time before the heroes attack. Once the heroes come in, you'll want to place Badman as far away as possible. Then it's an all-out attack. Hopefully, your monsters will defeat the heroes and your conquest of the planet can continue. But if they survive and make it all the way to Badman, they'll start to drag his ass out of the cave. And if they make it all the way back to the entrance of the cave, it's game over for you and the world is saved. That sucks. So you need to carefully plan out how you dig each dungeon as you don't want them to be too open or too easy for the righteous heroes to navigate. The game has a fantastic sense of humor, making fun of JRPGs every chance it gets and overall it's just delightful. It's extremely self-aware and that only adds to the experience. The visuals are pretty basic, but they don't really need to be anything more than what they are. The music is also plenty fine and pretty upbeat for such an evil game. If you have a PSP and you see this for sale and happen to be evil, be sure to pick this one up. Hell, you should pick it up even if you're a righteous person as it is one of the more unique games for the system. How about Destroy All Humans on the PlayStation 3 from THQ? It's also on the Xbox 360 as well as the weaker consoles like the PS2 and the Wii. You play as an alien named Crypto sent to Earth to collect DNA from human brain stems. But Crypto has been kind of slouching lately because he likes making money on Earth casinos now. And he sounds like a Cowboy Jack Nicholson or something. Fire and forget multi-round heat-seeking anal probes. Ha! Ah, this'll definitely shake some booty. I like crypto. But now other casinos and mobsters are closing in on your business and you've got to stop them all the while still collecting DNA from the humans. I swear, it seems like work is never done. It's pretty much an open world game like Grand Theft Auto where you can run around and cause wanton chaos just for fun or go on actual missions at a time of your choosing. You can run around quietly, but if you start causing trouble, then the police get called in and you have to deal with them. Sound familiar? Some of the things you can do is pick people up with your telekinesis and throw them against objects. Or you can just simply zap them into oblivion. Killing people will harvest brainstem DNA, so be sure to kill as many as you can. You can also give people an anal probe because, you know, that's what aliens do. They really, really love our anal orifices. You can also body snatch almost anyone and walk around unnoticed when you need to. But be careful, because this will kill the person if you stay inside of them for too long. That's okay, though. And you can putz around in your flying saucer and cause all sorts of alien chaos. You can even abduct scores of people all simultaneously when you're in your saucer. Instead of police cars being called, they bring in the heavy artillery like tanks to blast you from the sky. If your flying saucer is damaged, you can repair it by abducting a car and stealing its energy. I mean, of course. The game has a good sense of humor which is its main strength, because the visuals definitely are not a positive asset. It barely looks better than a PS2 game and the frame rate loves to drop. 
The sound is usually pretty soft and quiet. There's really nothing special about it other than the funny dialogue. I had no issues with the camera or the controls, but the game still somehow feels very dated. But for a game where you get to kill people and harvest their DNA, it's not terrible. And for a parody on alien abduction culture, it's fantastic. It's worth it for under 10 bucks, I'd say. Here's Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver for the Dreamcast. It was also released on the PS1 and the PC. This is the sequel to Blood Omen Legacy of Kane that we've talked about before. The story takes place 1500 very short years after the first game and stars Raziel. He was a lieutenant of Kane and he was pure evil as he helped create legions of vampires that set out to pillage and destroy all the humans of Nazgoth. Somewhere along the way, he did something to royally piss off Cain, so Cain killed him and threw him into the abyss. But Raziel was saved by an elder god and is now a wraith. Thus begins the story of how Raziel starts his rise back to meet Cain by killing his brethren along the way. The game is interesting and has a cool play mechanic. Raziel can switch between two planes as he makes his way around. You can enter the spectral plane at any time and when there, everything looks bluish green and contorts the backgrounds a bit. In this plane, you can fight, jump and glide, but you can't move physical objects. In the material plane, colors are more natural, well, that is if drab colors are natural to you, and nothing is distorted. To get to this plane, you have to have a full life bar that looks like a crooked Sega Dreamcast swirl and you have to use one of these blue portal things. In this plane, you can do everything from fighting with weapons, moving blocks, and opening doors. The areas that you traverse don't have a lot of enemies just roaming around and I'm fine with that. The ones that you come in contact with are mainly other vampires or demon type things. You can beat them up until your fists hurt, but you can't kill them that way. To kill them, you have to beat them up until they're stunned and then you can burn them or impale them. This will release their soul. You need to suck in that soul and this will fill your slowly depleting Sega swirl on the screen. I do like this aspect of changing planes in the game as it makes for some great puzzles. The puzzles are fun and actually pretty challenging which is refreshing. The only problem is that they drag on a bit too long sometimes. It wouldn't be so bad if the save function of the game was better. Every time you save and then restart, you start at the main hub of the game and have to go back through everything to get to where you were. The puzzles that you've solved are still completed, but you have to go through them again. That's not good and is one of the issues that I have. The second and biggest issue I have is how in the hell did we survive without two analog sticks back then? Playing this game on the Dreamcast is almost a chore because of this. Since there's only one analog stick, the camera controls got mapped to the directional pad. So if you want to look around, you have to stop moving and put your thumb on the D-pad to look at your surroundings. And another lame aspect is that you can only look left and right and not up and down. Wow, does this ever make finding higher platforms hard? Here you are, jumping around like an idiot trying to see if there's a high ledger platform you can reach. I haven't played the PlayStation version, but I imagine you can use the second analog stick to look around. Then the camera gets stuck behind objects at times, and again you have to stop to adjust it to your liking. But the game is playable and you just have to show a bit of patience. There's all sorts of abilities for Raziel to collect to help make his quest easier such as the ability to flow through doors in the spectral plane. The voice acting is still on par with the first game and it does a good job of keeping your interest. Your wings, though ruined, are not without purpose. Take hold of them as you leap and they will carry you across this chasm. Still, I'm not sure if this game really has enough to keep me invested in it these days. Maybe I'll try it again in 1500 short years. Here's Army Corps of Hell on the PS Vita from Square Enix. In this one, you play as the former King of Hell who's been cast out and stripped of his flesh. But you're soon able to gain control of some underlings to help you do your bidding so that you can retake all of Hell back for your very own. You start off with 30 little soldiers in your squad. What you want to do is get within range of an enemy which will make your gauge turn red. Then you press the R button to toss your soldiers onto the enemy to attack it. Once enough of your little guys get onto them, you can do a salvo attack which usually kills the enemy for good. Be careful though, because your soldiers are going to get knocked out a lot. 
Often they can be recovered by simply gliding right over them and they'll gleefully rejoin you. But sometimes they die and go to, I'm guessing, heaven, which would be true hell for any demon spawn. Often your enemies will leave a corpse behind for your guys to eat and also find items that you can use later. Once you defeat all the enemies on a certain block, a bridge will open up to the next area. Then you've just got to repeat this process until you finish the stage. On some blocks will be cages which will let you restore the soldiers that died in your name so you can have a full stock of them again, just as long as you have enough of the red jewel thingies. Between each stage you're usually granted a higher soldier allotment so that you can have more demons follow you and attack enemies. You can also make better weapons and stuff like that with the items that you found on the previous stages. There's different types of demons that you can get as well. Some demons, like the spearmen, work best attacking from far away. You can only control one group at a time, so you'll need to switch between them before you start tossing them around. So be sure to decide how many of this group and how many of that group you want before you start a stage. Eventually you'll get to a boss fight, and these are brutal because they absolutely murder all of your soldiers quickly, leaving you pretty much defenseless. For this reason, there's usually a soldier cage near the boss so you can get them back, but good luck, you'll definitely need it. I find this one enjoyable to play, though it can become quite repetitive in large doses. It really reminds me of an evil Pikmin the way you toss your guys on the enemies to destroy them and also the way they follow you around. Hell, I mean your little demons even kind of sound like Pikmin. But this one isn't Disney-fied and cute, so don't let your annoying little brother play it. Actually, maybe you should, he needs a little bit more evil in his life. Everyone does. This one isn't natively compatible with the PS TV, unfortunately, but if you've soft modded yours, it'll work. The problem comes when you need to do some rear touchscreen crap, which is hard as hell to do. Why the hell does the Vita even have a rear touchpad anyway? I mean, talk about the epitome of stupid. Were they trying to out gimmick Nintendo? It was a bad idea, Sony. The visuals are on par with what you'd usually see on the Vita, and that's not a bad thing. The frame rate's locked at 30 frames per second. The music's comprised of black and death metal of varying quality. And honestly, I think that's what keeps me playing a bit longer than I otherwise would with how repetitious this game can get. Still though, this one is unique to the Vita and it's something that I haven't seen very often in the wild. So should you get it? Well, it's decently cheap, so hell yeah, no pun intended. Or was it? All right, Dave, are you feeling evil? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't say evil, but I'm having a good time nonetheless. How about you? You feeling evil? Not evil enough. I think I need to see more games. Good idea. Let's do that. This is Prinny. Can I really be the hero for the PSP? It's a side story from the Disgaea series starring those little penguin looking creatures. Prinnies are created when a human who has led an evil life or committed a mortal sin has died. Their soul is reborn into a prinny and they become servants trying to rectify the wrongs that they've committed. So yeah, that's a prinny and yes, they count as a bad guy since that's what they were in their previous life. Another fact about prinnies that's kind of funny but also kind of annoying at times is that they must end every sentence with the word dude. <laughs> You're pretty smart for a prinny, dude! After the first dozen times it gets annoying, dude. But still, it's a pretty fun game, dude. It's known for its insane difficulty and that was done on purpose, dude. See what I mean? Totally annoying, dude. But yeah, the creators wanted to make a tough game and therefore gave you 1,000 printing lives per game. Unless you're some sort of noob, you're most likely not going to use up all of those lives to beat the game. The platforming can be difficult at times and you'll make a lot of jumping mistakes. The jumping mechanic is borrowed from Super Ghouls and Ghosts. You have a double jump that's really handy but you can't control the direction while you're in the air. It takes a bit of practice to get the feeling of when to time a double jump so you can land on platforms or floating carpets. The enemies can also be a pain in the ass as they're all over the place and even in spots where you don't expect them, but at least you have a kick-ass sword to take them out. You can do a hip drop on your enemies which will stun them. A stunned enemy will take more damage than one that you just attack head on. And you have two types of attack. A ground attack which is capable of hitting enemies on all sides of you. Yes, even enemies behind you will get hit with your wild sword swings. Then there's the jump aerial attack. This one takes a bit of getting used to since the screen turns slightly when you perform this attack. It's also tough since you have to perform the move at a certain distance from your enemies or it won't hit them. 
I first thought this was a cool attack, but just like the constant use of the word dude, it gets kind of old. And of course, there's various tanks and other vehicles that you can use from time to time that are luckily just laying around the level. These are on a time limit, and they feel way weaker than they should. Look at this tank and tell me why it only shoots about 5 feet in front of it. That's a stupid tank. But on the whole, this is a fun game. The graphics are nice with lots of detail and animations. The 2.5D backgrounds are very colorful with lots of depth and cool artwork. The music is also really good and has some nice guitar work which is really pleasing to my ears. If you still own a PSP, this is one to have for your collection. Wario first made his appearance in the amazing Game Boy game Super Mario Land 2. He was the badass and very ugly final boss in that game. Instead of continuing the series with Mario as the protagonist, Nintendo did something that I still have trouble accepting. Super Mario Land 3 came out and it starred that terrible ugly guy Wario. After Mario kicks Wario out of his castle in part 2, Wario decides he wants his own castle. He invades Kitchen Island to steal all of their coins and treasure to have enough money to buy one for himself. Wario is truly a evil son of a big gun. Son of a gun. The game is still an action platformer, but Wario controls different from Mario. He of course can jump on enemies, but he can also bump into them, which I never liked. In a normal game, that would result in your character getting hurt, but not here. He can also ram into enemies when he's big, which actually makes more sense. There's three different hats that Wario can get along the way that have different abilities. I'll bet you can't guess what this hat does. Get your mind out of the gutter. It gives him a dragon helmet that can chew fire, which is very handy. Wario isn't the most nimble character out there, and he controls like he looks, big and slow. But if you give the game a chance, you'll come to accept the controls and sluggishness like I did. Apparently, the game was popular enough because Wario went on to get a whole bunch of other games with his name on it. As you might sense, I'm not the biggest fan of Wario games. I wish Nintendo would have just gave him his own game and let Mario have Super Mario Land 3. I mean, sheesh, his name's in the title. This is Overlord Raising Hell on the PlayStation 3 from Codemasters. It's also on the 360 and your favorite flavor of OS on a PC. I mean, even Mac and Linux. At the beginning of the game, you're resurrected so that you may become the Overlord and spread evil. And that's pretty much your mission here, be evil and spread evil, though you might not actually know it sometimes as you play. You start out by being able to summon minions who follow you around and obey your commands. You can send them out to kill stupid sheep and collect energy which will let you summon even more minions. As time goes on, you'll be able to keep more minions with you at a single time. You'll eventually be able to get different kinds of minions who are better suited for different tasks as well. It's kind of similar to Army Corps of Hell in these regards, but that's where most of the similarities end. You use your evil minions to do almost everything in this game from attacking enemies to pushing objects out of the way. Generally, you can just push them forward by pressing the R2 button and they'll know what to do in most situations. But you can also lead them around at your will by piloting them with the right analog stick. Minions also like smashing things and finding treasure and that makes them really happy. As Overlord, you can also step in and battle yourself if your minions aren't getting everything done themselves. You deal much more damage than they can. You also have various types of magic like fire to burn your enemies who are all hiding in the wheat. Yeah, burn! All of you! I'm evil! If you get low on life or magic, you can sacrifice some of your minions at certain pits and they'll gladly die so that you can get your powers and life back. It's usually no big deal anyway because right nearby is a pit to summon new minions and refill your stock. Now all this sounds really evil and stuff, but a lot of times you're killing ugly halflings and helping out normal humans. In fact, they're usually very nice to you and not at all fearful. Sometimes it just doesn't feel like I'm evil. I mean, I think I should be killing people, too. Oh well, I guess there's no point in ruling the land if there's nobody to rule over, right? Since you control your minions with the right analog stick, the camera takes care of itself and that can sometimes be problematic. I often found myself trying to control it with the right stick like any third-person game, but obviously that doesn't work. You can click on the right stick to switch to an overhead mode if you like, but I found the normal third-person mode to be more enjoyable. The graphics are fairly nice with plenty of detail for such an early game on the system, but the frame rate can leave a lot to be desired. 
There's not a lot of music to speak of, just sounds of battle and mayhem. And dialogue. Lots of dialogue. The game uses humor to keep things light, so you don't have to worry about your parents locking the game away from you until you're old enough. This is a good, fun game to have, and I'm going to keep an eye out for the sequel because, hell, it might even be better. This must be the work camp, those peasants. They're throwing rocks. Primitives! <laughs> Here's Darksiders by V-Hill Games released in 2010 for the PS3, Xbox 360, and PC. Later it got remastered and released on the PS4, Wii U, Xbox One, and PC, but I'm on the PS3 here. This is the story of heaven, hell, and the human race. You play as War, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. His sole duty is to help bring the end of the world when the time has come. War gets the summons that the final battle has begun, but when he gets to Earth he finds out that the summons wasn't real. He gets stripped of his powers by the Charred Council and thus begins his quest to find out the truth. So yeah, War isn't a good guy. Once he straightens out this little problem, it's back to waiting to eliminate humans at the end of all things. But on a side note, this game is incredibly fun. It plays a lot like many of my favorite games of the time like God of War. You run around and kill everything, collecting different colored souls to fill life, magic, and money. It also plays a bit like a Zelda game where your movement is limited to an area until you collect an item that will help you get further and open up new areas. Since your character was stripped of all his powers, all he has is a sword. It's a huge gargantuan sword and uh, look, he also has a huge gargantuan hand too. I wonder what he uses that for. To get War back to his old self again, you must collect blue souls which are the currency in the game. All the enemies that you fight will give them up when they die. And they don't just give up one soul, they give up multiples which makes me question why do these things have more than one soul? Well I guess they act like money so it's kind of like you're stealing their wallet after you kill them. Even inanimate objects have blue souls. Like tables and chairs have souls which of course makes complete sense. And also cars have souls. I love picking up cars and throwing them at enemies. And when the car explodes you'll get some of those blue souls. Hey, it's more money in my pocket. But that money won't last long since every area has a demon merchant named Volgrim who collects souls and in return will give you new abilities and other items to make war stronger. It all works out very well and although it doesn't feel original in a lot of ways it's still very entertaining. The areas are all very large and will typically take many hours to get through. The puzzles are intriguing at times but for the most part they're not going to tax your brain. What's nice is that every now and then the game breaks up the normal gameplay with something a little different. Like here where you fly through a level on the back of some huge beast. You lock onto your enemies and blast him all very similar to Panzer Dragoon. The developers are obviously fans and the level is really fun to play. Graphically the game is pleasing. You might think that is very drab with all its gray colors. And I would normally agree with you but given the setting as a post apocalyptic world it's fitting. War and all the enemies and characters are all very detailed and really look amazing. The backgrounds aren't as amazing but still look good given the game is almost 8 years old. You know what else is good? The voice acting. Not all of the voice actors are well known but they do a really good job of selling the story. There's one character that follows you who's voiced by Mark Hamill and as usual he's very convincing. Let's lay down a few ground rules. Until this is over, you're a dog on a leash. I say bark, you bark. And if I have to kick you, you'd better not bare your teeth. All in all, this is a great game and if you're up to playing a bad guy, you can't go wrong with this title. There's a sequel that I haven't played yet, but it's one of those games that I do own. So maybe look for it in an upcoming episode sometime. Alright, there you go. Games where you get to play as the villain, and I'm so glad that I am not influenced by games because I'd be totally evil at this point. Yeah, I'm sure you would be, but uh, again, this was refreshing to play as something other than good, and what are some games that you know of that are fun to play where you are the villain? Let us know. And thank you for watching Game Say.
Hey Joe, what are you doing here? Well, that's a stupid question, right? Well, let's not beat around the bush, okay? Because we both know why I'm here. I'm here to take your snatcher and, hey, look, I got it already. I'll see you later. <laughs> so easy, God. Oh, that is evil.